This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here, go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. It's no different than being a professional baseball player. You can't be a one-trick pony. You have to be a five-tool player in order to succeed in this game. This is the Power Producers Podcast. Production redefined. Are you ready to feel the power? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Today, we have Miss Ciara from south florida with us what's going on hi thanks for having me i'm excited to be here i'm gonna need not even use your last name because, <laughs> I, yeah well i know that but <laughs> i just think that if you tell people you have ciara on your podcast that like you're gonna yeah. have everybody's gonna listen, listen to that they're gonna expect me to get up and do the one two step <laughs> and uh, <laughs> if i was her i would not be here you know yeah <laughs> well <laughs> <laughs> yeah, either that or goodies. You know, yeah. I, I'm trying to rewind back to like 2000, 2001 when I was in that awkward stage of being out of school, but you still like to go to. Stage. Yeah, still like to go back to the club. Stage. I yeah. like to go. To, I still like to go to the club on Thursday nights with all the college kids, though. And I was yeah. like 20, 26. <laughs> It's actually tw- 28. I did the math quick in my head, but that's when, like, that's when that was hot and yeah. Nelly, yeah. Nelly was was Not good. It was oh, no. uh, love. <laughs> It was good time. So anyhow, but I do have this thing now where I don't know what my problem is, but somehow I have this mental block where I get Ciara and uh, Rihanna mixed mm. up and they're yeah. not the same. I, it's, not the same. I don't know. No. Ru- Russell Wilson would not be happy with me <laughs> no. for that. No. <laughs> I run zero risk if Russell Wilson he's ever finds nice But he's kind of weird though. His, his, I saw like he had a recent Instagram live uh like posts that he did where he was <laughs> calling himself uh, Mr. Unlimited. It was very, very cringeworthy. Just look it up. It's, I, I can't even do justice by describing it, but it's like you're sitting there watching, you're just like, oh, God, stop. He's a little odd. He's, he's, he's a dork. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah he's, he's just kind of dorky. He's a nice guy, but whatever. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Well, he's never going to, he's never going to be our competition. Neither is the real Tiara. So we're good. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm the real CR. I'm older than her, I think. So, <laughs> well, look, maybe we need to address that with her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then she has people saying her name's Sierra. Right, that bothers me because it's not. We're not the desert. We're not the car. I'm not the drink. <laughs> yeah, it's not Sierra. Right. Yeah, no. I like. It. I, no, I'm with you. I never, I never had that part. Yeah. So listen, you guys are. Are you even a year old yet? Uh, on paper, yes, we are. Um, but. Not really. Not uh, running things tightly. We started in January. We had hired um, really? Guillermo, our first producer, in November. Um, but we were, you know, toying around with getting a bigger office space. It was, you know, not really much was happening. And then we moved to a bigger office space in the building that we're in. We hired three telemarketers, um, just doing the regular telemarketing for us, them three, and then. COVID happened and it all went to crap. And now you're operating out of your living room. Now I'm operating out of our living room. Our building is closed to visitors. We're actually thinking about going back September 1st. Okay. That'll help. Yeah, I think so. I mean, not that you're struggling or anything, but I mean, I just, for me, even even though, even though a lot of people weren't going to work, I'm literally the only one at the office in Valrico. So I had to like this, this is my escape. Like I can't, I can function from a technology platform standpoint and everything else remotely, 
What I can't do is operate a business with my wife and four kids at home. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't have any kids, so it's easier. My husband worked from home in the beginning, but then he ended up going back to his office. And then Guillermo came to work here with me. So we're working side by side there in the living room. Now yeah, it's that probably no- back to work and like not just caring for Nash all the time. It's like, I'm like, dude, this sucks, bro. Yeah, yeah your life just got way worse, man. Oh, man. It's- I'll never forget. Listen, I'll never forget. And I, I obviously, I love all my kids. I would do anything for you them. You know the story is going to be great. When right, when it starts that, that way. <laughs> but I have, to, I have to say, you know, I was 40 years old when Caroline was born. Yeah. And I'm not going to say my life sucked about it. All I'm going to say is I was perpetually tired from getting up in the middle of the night and everything else. And I I mean, I just looked at Annie one day and I'm like, everything blends. This is why people do this in their early 20s. Yeah. Like, I just have the stamina for it. It's, yeah, it's weird, man. I mean, you, you, you realize that you're able to function on like three, four hours of sleep and, it, it's like at the end of the, you sit there at the end of the day, you're like, damn, like, where did the day go? <laughs> like, it's yeah. gone. Yeah. Like, it's not a big deal. Like, Caroline's going to turn seven here in another week, September 3rd. She turned seven. Huh. And, and Grayson's birthday. <laughs> yeah. Grayson's like 10 or 11 years older than she was. And just the amount of energy that I lost in that 10 year <laughs> time period is crazy. And I'm going to tell you the other thing. It's nuts. And, you know, I'll probably catch heat for saying this, but, you know, she had some pretty significant gas, not gastro, but like uh, reflux issues. Right. So she constantly would have acid coming back up into her throat after she drank her bottle. And, you know, as a relatively newborn baby, you can't articulate that. You just scream (laughs) at the top of your lungs and cry nonstop. And so we would end up holding her for like, hours probably Mm. 20 out of the 24 hours a day and my main goal was just to figure out how to fall asleep on the couch with her laying on my chest so that we could both sleep or whatever right but like then there were those times where she would have it so bad there was nothing you could do to get her to stop and i mean i'm talking about like for 30 minutes to an hour at a pop and i I told andrea i'm like you know what what did they end up doing i don't remember i I know we talked about this a couple months ago when nash was born but like i don't yeah no they gave her they gave her um medicine like she started with however it was you went from uh prilosec to prevacid to whatever the third they had a stair step mechanism that they used but it was so bad. I told Annie, I said, I really, I get it. I said, I can understand. I said, I, I don't read any more into this than what I'm telling you, but I can understand how somebody who is not mentally stable, like doesn't like, I can understand why they kill their kids. Like I can see how somebody would shake a baby to the point yeah, that it would kill it. Because like, if you had fine, if you had financial stress, imagine this, you're working two jobs, mm-hmm. you can't pay your bills, you just, you know, got something else in the mail and you go in and your kid's screaming at the top of their lungs, that kid doesn't have a, doesn't stand a chance. Like yeah. you're already fried before you ever walk in the door. And so it's, it's a testament to how much stress we're able to put up with mm-hmm. because it was bad, man. It was bad. Like I've got a bad temper to begin I with. To figure out that it was acid reflux. Obviously, like we talked about, you know, babies just can't. tests. Just yeah, just tests. The doctor were doctor was able to figure it out. We'd been through some of that with Ethan. We were really, we were really hoping it wasn't a precursor of the things we're dealing with with Ethan. Thank yeah. God it's not. I mean, holy crap, man! The intelligence level of a little girl compared to a little boy is ridiculous. Like. Hmm. I I feel like I'm talking to like a 20 year old half the time. Like it's amazing. Yeah, your hands. Full. That is true. Yeah, it's amazing some of the things that come out of her mouth. Like my boys, like their idea of you know stimulation is peeing off the side of a balcony or something like that. <laughs> Which first of all is sick. I was right? going to say yeah. I don't think that goes away ever. Yeah. You don't no. grow out of that as a boy. No. Anytime but I like, see a balcony, I'm like, you know what would be really fun to do is just pee off of that thing. <laughs> Well, maybe I should buy him a balcony. Though. <laughs> but, you know, with her, it's like, Caroline, I was wondering on Sit the Science Kid, it was talking about such and such. And she'll go, well, actually, Daddy, what I learned in school was it. I'm like, oh, here we go. Like, <laughs> I know my hands are t- or, I look and she's not truthful all the time either. <laughs> like, she's already misleading me. She's already giving us pushback 
because of the dress code at school. The dress code at school is your shorts have to be down, you know, at your fingertips or whatever. Caroline's she's wearing some short shorts <laughs> and she does not like you telling her she has to go change her shorts at all. Yeah. So whatever. Anyhow, listen, we started talking about your agency. Tell everybody how you got started in insurance to begin with. And it's okay if you give a shout out to the G here or there. Yeah. So Insure, I never thought I'd be in insurance, obviously. My parents both worked for Corporate America all of my youth. My mom worked for Equifax all her life. And my dad had a job with the brake part company, got uh, the company went under, he got laid off, he got a a uh, like bonus at the end, like a package to go away basically, and he used it to get his 220. But my brother and I were going starting to go to college, so he ended up getting an offer from UPS. He got hired with a big firm down here, um, but it was commission only. We were going to college, and he decided to go uh, the safer route. Went worked for UPS, and then ended up hating it. And at 49, he took money out of his 401k and opened up an Allstate office. My mom had gotten fired from Equifax in a in a in the airport in the lobby of an airport after a business trip. She had been working there for 36 years. And um Jeez. yeah, just like that. Literally her only job ever. And they fired her like in 2 minutes after they went on a business trip and so and shortly thereafter he had lost his job and he was like, I've had enough with corporate America. Yeah. I was going to the art Institute of Fort Lauderdale for interior design and they couldn't afford ah, it. <laughs> I caught you now. Now I know why your branding and everything looks ah. so good. Okay. <laughs> keep going. So, um, I ended up, they couldn't afford it anymore. My dad's like, you're going to have to work with us at the agency. So he opened up his first all state. And it was me, my mom, and my dad, nine to seven every day. We started from zero. Um, and it was torture. <laughs> and then we ended up opening a second office. We did good. We won all the trips. They did great. Uh, and then we realized every time we'd go on, on some of these trips, we'd realize, well, it's a family business. Everybody has their mother-in-law, their father-in-law, their wife, their wife's sister. And it's because they all also had such great bonuses at the time that they just kept opening satellite offices. And someone in the family had an independent where they would funnel all the business that didn't qualify with Allstate, which is a lot. So we finally got the sauce and we opened up our independent. My dad was downstairs in his Allstate and I was upstairs. So, and at that time, people still came in the office. So if someone came in and was like, I'm canceling, I'm going to go to someone else. My insurance keeps going up. My dad would be like, well, my daughter has an agency upstairs. He'd walk me upstairs, walk the customer upstairs, and we would do it. Nice. You know, it's funny because ever since you, and I'm not going to use names on here, obviously, but ever since you told me that that's what the deal was, I can't tell you the number of all state offices that I go by that have an independent next mm -hmm. door. Oh yeah. We were just trying to be a little more, you know, not as obvious, but yeah, ours was upstairs. Yep. And so, uh, we, he ended up selling, we love the independent life. We love the options, you know, with the all state, you can't really do much commercial. So he ended up selling the all state offices, taking over the independent. And then he sold it about two years ago. Uh, and then here we are. I started this agency. He's retired doing real estate. And I started this agency on paper maybe about a year and a half ago, but we've actually been hitting it hard since January. So January rolls around, you're getting, you know, fired up and everything. And then COVID happens. Like what, obviously there's been a million different challenges, but what, what would you say has been the, the, the biggest hurdle for you so far? Uh, it was tough. It was tough. I, I've never had to myself fire or let go of anybody. And um, the telemarketers that we had, they were part time. They had just started. Um, it's not like I could send them home with equipment. And who are they going to call during that time to see if they want their insurance shopped? You know, like it's not even a thing. And that was so difficult for me. And I, I yeah. had, while I let them go, I was crying. Like I felt so awful. They have babies, you know, they needed the jobs. So that was, it started real rough when we hadn't even been quarantined yet, but we knew it was coming. Right. So I did that. And then um, I think the hardest part has been really trying to 
uh, reinvent ourselves because we started doing a little bit of personal lines. We um, had a couple homeowners carriers, but down here in South Florida, they're all restricted. Everything is going to citizens and I'm not appointed with citizens and I don't have any interest in being appointed with, with them for, I'm not going to do the homeowners. It's not worth it. I don't have the, the, the power with the staff to keep up with the customer service and it's just not worth my time really. Mm -hmm. So I had some of the carriers that I had that we've had since the all state days, I had really good relationships with them and they gave me the appointment, but now they're not writing, you know, anything older than 2010. Well, I mean, that's nothing. Everything down here is older than 2010. Right. <laughs> so we were like, okay, well, we, we have commercial experience, but not in the middle market. Our largest account at my dad's old agency was in a HVAC company. Um, probably about 40 trucks on the road. It was a good, good account. The guy was, yeah, that's, that's nothing to sneeze at. No. And then we did his personal, he was our largest, largest customer. Uh, the guy was challenging though. It was very, very, very stressful. And he did <laughs> not take me serious. Like the only person I could talk to him was my dad. Like I was beneath him. So it was tough. Why do you think that is? I think that, um, I think that this industry is very, still very heavily male dominated. And, and, I, I, and by the way, I agree with that. I'm just wanting you to say it out loud so that every, everybody yeah. else can hear it. It's, it's, and you know, I, luckily we're here in South Florida. It's very diverse. Uh, I don't even really feel a lot of issues with being Hispanic, you know, down here, everyone is, but in the industry, I don't, I also haven't had that happen to me as far as like, um, you know, being a woman and being looked down on. I think that there's a lot of men. I have surrounded myself with a lot of men that believe in me probably more than I do. My husband believe I am like, I can never do anything wrong. He is my biggest fan. So is my dad. Thankfully, Guillermo. Guillermo has my back and he is like, you can do anything that anybody else can do. Men like you, you know, that give women a platform and a space to be bold and be aggressive. And it's not a bad thing, you know, like some people perceive it. I have a, a really good friend named Alex Lopaso. He's a, he's an agency owner in Miami who is just like supportive and, and great. Just I've surrounded myself. I have a couple underwriters that are really, really like, yes, they want to see women succeed. But from the outside, the customers, uh, I've had last year was probably the worst it's ever happened. It's the only time it's happened to me that bad. The other guy at the other, he was just rude to me. He wouldn't listen to me. He'd be like, I could tell him something. The G would get on the phone and tell him the same thing. And that was the gospel. Mm -hmm. but I, and by the way, for those of you listening, the G, the G is her dad. The G is my dad. He's awesome. Yeah. Um, but last year, right when we first started, we I had this guy that was the absolute worst I had never had this happen to me. He was he was referred to me by a, a good referral partner. So I have to take him. Uh, you know, I can't. I, I took his crap for about a week and a half. And I took it and I took it. And then at the end, I was just like, I, I, I cannot handle this guy. I mean, he, he it, the, the relationship started with him telling me that he was going to make me a good insurance agent and that. And talking about himself, right? In third party. Like I came, he came into my life to teach me. Hold on. This guy was a prospect and yeah. he was telling you that. Yeah. And that, cause that we were having some issues with some of the quotes and he was, and he accused me of like trying to get in the way of him getting a lower rate so that he was going to file an Arizona mission insurance claim on me because he can, and he knows how to. And he even went to the extent of accusing me of, being difficult because it was that time of the month. Oh, <laughs> and I was like, okay, I I had like had it, and I called my underwriter and I said, listen, I cannot deal with this guy. Transfer it to another agency. He was like, Ciara, but you did all the work. It was a good sized commission. It'd pay my rent. We had just started. I was like, I can't do it because the level of disrespect, it's just too much. It's too much. And the guy was like, my underwriter was like, Ciara, but you did all the work. Don't do that. Whatever. And then finally, my husband was like, listen, men like that are never going to change. And men like that just talk to everyone like that, especially women. Just take mm -hmm. money. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm just going to take his money. <laughs> you, you know, like I had done all the work and I had already taken all the abuse. 
Right. But it's also because I had just started. Debate on it. <laughs> yeah, right. I had just started though. So we'll see now it's coming up for Reno at the end of the year. We'll see what how his tone is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I think that a lot of the time what happens is, and I mean, I, look, we can go into a million different rabbit holes over all of this stuff. But I think the thing that bothers me the most is most people don't realize that they're acting the way they are. And I'm now this guy probably does, but right. I, feel like I think you're talking about yourself in third person, yeah, right. you kind of know that you are. <laughs> Dave, David never talks about himself in a third person, right. but you know, my, my thing is like, I can see people overlooking you to get to your dad. Like oh. you don't own the agency. No. You're just an account manager and I don't want to deal with you. You, you, you're not a, you're not able to own an agency. You're not important enough for my time. That's why my or dad, whatever else. My dad, you have to get your designations because having those letters behind your name, it's going to help you with the adversity you're going to face of being young and being the, a woman. Some people just don't take the advice as serious. Literally my dad could say the same exact thing I said on the phone. And it mm-hmm. was, he was right. And I was yeah. a receptionist. Yeah. And I mean, I, I don't understand from your shoes what that's like, but I understand what it's like to have good ideas or be willing to contribute to an organization. And maybe age was the reason or a relationship. Right. So I I get it. I mean, there's there's nothing more frustrating to me than knowing that I have a good marketing plan or a good idea from a business standpoint, offering that up, making yourself vulnerable to the audience of people that you're presenting this to, which in my case was other business partners, and then just having them crap all over it like, you know, there's no merit to it or whatever else. So I finally had put up with it long enough. I just decided, you know what, I'll just go start my own deal and I'll do everything that I've been telling everybody else I would do and we'll see if it works or not. And now my agency's twice the size of theirs. So obviously I knew something, you know, but, um, you know, the, the, that's not what it's about, though. And I think that I think that we do have an issue in the agent agents world where it's male dominated. I mean, it's it's everywhere. And if you're not a male, you know, it's almost like if you're not the cookie cutter prototype of what you would expect a pharmaceutical sales rep to look like, like ex college cheerleader, you know, coming out to you know, Kyle knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. But that's that's what they throw at you. And to me. That doesn't solve the problem. That just makes it worse because this isn't even real. You're only putting somebody in here because they're eye candy and nobody's listening to what they say in the meeting anyhow. Yeah. Payroll companies do that all the time. Yeah. ADP is the worst. I I didn't know if I could say it, but yeah, they hire like all you have to be is pretty and have like pretty hair and a good bod and you're out there. Right. Young. Yeah. 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 Young. And, And I mean, shame on us for that. Right. Like, I don't know. I don't know how it ever gets solved, to be honest with you. I think you just by talking about it and continuing to make people aware that things are happening. I think that it, it is changing for the better. Uh, I met, I went to Elevate a couple of years ago when Ryan ran it. Uh, mm-hmm. I, and I met him there and Sid and um, I met a lot of people, women specifically too, that are kind of taking it um, like face on. They're They're here to disrupt some stuff. And it was refreshing. Uh, I can promise you, Teresa and Denise yeah. from the women of IAOA yeah. have no problem yeah. disrupting yeah. anything. Yep, yeah. I love it. I think it's great because I think honestly, even women ourselves, some women might feel like they belong in the de- in the desk processing certificates. No, not at all. Like I, any woman can do this job, own the agency, run the show. It does. It's not limited to picking up the phone. And probably I'm- better than a man, mm-hmm. honestly. Like, I'll be the first one to admit, I need women in my life, period, that keep, are, hand- that are that handlers. Hand. Yeah, to keep me straight. Because otherwise, I'm an animal. Like, <laughs> that's it. Like, I, I don't have that ability. Like, I, if I didn't have my wife at home, my God, it would be like when she leaves town for a week 
it's uh, a white it's a white knuckle ride. Like it really is. As long as the kids are alive, in bed, right. and fed, yeah. that's all I care about. I will let dishes pile what up. About a until shower? Do they get a shower? Yeah, they get the showers and the baths. I even train them to wash each other like a commune, <laughs> like a commune of chimpanzees, like picking bugs out of each other's fur. Sit in a circle so they can all get each other's back. Yeah, something like that. But. And then, then I'll pay a cleaning lady to come in the day before she's coming back into town. So when she walks in, everything's Great. pristine. Yeah. But I mean, I I know what my weaknesses are. But I mean, I can tell you when you don't think that way, like when you, you like, I'm sure that every single one of us, I don't care who you are, has some predetermined bias of some type against something, right? Sure. I mean, I could, I I can I think admit it's that. Well, not to right. So, but, but that being said, I know that I don't have a bias towards women in the workplace. I never have. I think that some people just automatically, I think on the flip side, if I were to be devil's advocate, I think there are women that will automatically assume that because you're a man in this industry, that you have that same predetermined bias until you prove them wrong. And, and what really, what offended me about all of this was when I posted a picture I posted that picture of Polito coming in and doing the, the fabric swatches. Yeah. And I said, all each of our producers gets a full suit, blah, 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 blah. And somebody said, well, what, what do you do for the women? I do. And rem- I'm like, yeah, I'm yeah. like, well, unfortunately we don't have any female producers right now. Honest to God, I've never had anybody as a candidate. Actually, I would say that the closest thing I have to a candidate of a female producer is Carol Ingram. You yeah. know, and, She's I and when when all of this stuff went down with well she was a really good uh referral source for my agency at Wells Fargo yeah, payroll suit, and then they you get her a custom binder a big ass like three <laughs> <laughs> and, Carol Ingram is the quintessential sell by a portfolio payroll person <laughs> she would walk in I hope she's listening to this so she I. would she would walk into a meeting and she had a binder that was no less than four inches thick. <laughs> yeah, that was and when she, I first started, man. That was like that was probably I, I, maybe like first week we went on that appointment. We and, were in that appointment to the place that retrofitted the CVSs, and all I remember is it was like we were in an oven. They had no air conditioning. So it was like a hundred and ten degrees, and she. She like <laughs> lugged that binder out to lay it on the table. I literally put my hand. This is in a sales meeting. And this account was probably twenty, thirty thousand in revenue. So yeah, it was, it was a nice size. opportunity. Bro. Right. I reach over and put my hand on the cover of her binder in the meeting and say, hey, in the interest of time, let's go ahead and get the workers comp stuff out of the way. And then Kyle and I will excuse ourselves and allow you to finish the rest of the stuff so that we're not taking away from you. There was not a snowball's chance in hell. I was sitting in that oh, room man. for an oh, hour God. or longer, but I mean, she's probably the only one that, that I've ever had a relationship with in, in terms of a referral relationship that I was, th- that I had actually even broached the subject with to talk to her. And then um, timing just didn't work out because Wells got acquired by ADP on their payroll side. And she, I ended up helping her, land at another payroll service that we refer business to now. But um, it's interesting. And I would be, I would wonder why there aren't more female producers There's in not. agencies in, in, in what's in, And I don't, there has to be a reason for that though, because it seems like if you're a lady in the industry, you're either working a desk mm-hmm. or you run the agency, like you own it. That's it. Mm-hmm. There's like no, in between. And I really feel like that we lose a competitive advantage by not having women in that production role. And I know there are some, but it seems like the, the majority, even then when you get into um, the production side, most of the time they focus on benefits. Right. I I have one down here where we are that um, she was in our BNI chapter uh, we actually took her spot because her, she works for an agency that has a threshold and they had increased the threshold. So she wasn't getting referrals that size. So we became really good friends with her. Her name is Lauren Montgomery and she is fire. And there is n- nobody. I have never met a producer. I haven't even, honestly, she's the first and only, I know two women producers. They're both pretty aggressive, but she's, she is yeah, she is awesome at what she does, and she's in the construction industry, so it's even like 
more tough. <laughs> you have to be more hmm. aggressive to hang with those yeah. boys because they don't take us serious. And she does it and she's very successful at it. She's Good like, for her. yeah. And she helps us out. So she refers us anything that falls under her threshold. Nice. You can't do it anyway. So we have a really good relationship and I call her for stuff. If I need stuff, she's always there. She's willing to help. She's great. So aside from COVID, you know, January, you start putting everything, you start locking and loading. What's been your biggest challenge outside of COVID? If, if you can even isolate it at this <laughs> point, because I think everything's influenced it by is. COVID. It so is. seems like it. Uh, yeah. I, I think that um, we had had, I guess, an approach of, well, I would say, Carrier appointments has been a big challenge uh, for us, as, especially down here in South Florida. Direct appointments are really not a thing, with especially with the commercial writers. Uh, yeah, I think that's nuts. And I mean, for anybody that's a commercial carrier rep that's listening to this, and the fact that I know that Ciara and her agency are involved in killing commercial, and they are going to tear up the middle market down there, you would be absolutely nuts not to entertain a conversation with them because they're going to absolutely crush it. So I would highly recommend that if you're looking to grow profitable business in Southeast Florida, which I know is not common, you need to reach out to her. She's going to give your contact information at the end, but don't forget. Yeah. We, the, the carrier appointments has been quite the issue because we have to go through brokers and that's not always, it's the worst. It's, Look, it's, they have their place. I get it, right? I, I understand. But I mean, when you're dealing with the admitted market and you're going in and you're working on middle market accounts that are six figures in premium, there is nothing more humiliating to me than delivering a policy binder that has whoever the MGA's name on it, not your agency. And mm -hmm. like, what do you explain at that point, right? So, so much of our process has nothing to do with the actual insurance itself, but all of the other things that are influencing the cost of that, that I just made it, I made it an easy answer early on in Florida risk when I was having to do that same thing while I was waiting for direct contracts and everything. And I just told them, look, you know, it really, and again, it also helped that, it, that some of my business was on a service fee too. So it didn't matter because I wasn't, it wasn't a commission issue for me as much as it was just access to the market. And I just would explain, Hey, you know, here's the deal. Um, you know, we are still putting together our list of who we want to work with. And right now it makes more sense for us to do it this way. All we do is use, use these people to access the market. I still structure everything, but you know, and certificates will still come with our company name, but it's just, I don't like that. I don't, I don't like that at all. It's, it's terrible. And it's also terrible to just the relationship, getting anything done takes two days. I mean, it, and we're just starting out. So I understand being an underwriter, the people that feed you the most and feed you the best are the ones that get your first attention. So it has been very difficult to find an underwriter that we can bond with, that we can you know, really, really res that responds to us quickly. Uh, it's been tough. So the ca the carrier appointments for us, and you know, we're we're looking at going after a couple niches. We're playing with the idea of uh, going after like life sciences. There's a couple big places down here that do life sciences, um, and RPS really is where we would go. And we ha we are appointed with them, but I know that there are carriers that do direct. I know Chubb does a lot of it. Oh, Chubb does. And I mean, the thing is with Chubb, they're not completely shutting people down for getting appointments. They have you go through, I forget what the name of it is, but there's a, there's a segment of their operation that they only want like $50,000 worth of premium a year. But essentially you're dealing with a service center until you build up to get enough to have a direct appointment with them. I know this because I literally just went through this process myself and that's what they had wanted to do. They wanted me to go that route. And I didn't, I just told them it wasn't going to work. You know, I, I, at one point in my career, I had over 7 million in premium with Chubb. So I know how to produce for them. I know their market, right. you know, the, the appetite and, and everything else. And I just let, let the person that I was dealing with know that, you know, honestly, the reason I want to deal with Chubb is because of the relationships that I already have 
with underwriters in your Tampa office, going to a service center is not helping life situation right, solve your problem. at all. And so I said, and listen, I get your position. If it's okay, if you're not able to offer me a contract and we can do business directly, because listen, again, they don't realize, but with Chubb, I would take my underwriters out to the new business appointments with me. I would take their loss control with me. And they like to do that. They like to be involved in the risk from the beginning. And I just explained, I said, you know, if if that's not something you're able to consider, then I'm just going to move to the next on my list. And I'll talk to CNA or Zurich or another one of your competitors that wants to aggregate business in that space. And unfortunately, I'll have to terminate my relationship with you through the subagent agreement that I have right now. And I'll just place the business with who's willing to give me a direct contract. I wasn't worried about the commitment. They wanted a million dollars in the first year. That's like three or four accounts. You know, that's not a, it's not like it's an impossible feat to hit. But, you know, I think the other thing too is a lot of carriers are afraid to give new entities an appointment because so many people have done it the wrong way for so long. Like they don't open up an agency and immediately start doing business the way you would expect them to. It's every bucket shop known to man, you know, that's asking them to give them a contract. And at some point the carrier caves, they give them a contract and the results are exactly what they expected them to be. They suck. I think that they also, to, they, they think that, well, you're learning to run a, a, an agency and learning insurance together. Well, that's not our case. I mean, we all state was, is all state, but we learned a lot of good things with all state. I mean, those people watch everything you do. And there was not a UM form that could not be signed within 15 minutes of an application being bound. <laughs> That's not, we, we know how to do that. There's not, we don't have a mess of like documentation floating around that I need this. We do it complete. I mean, we got that training and we've been doing it for almost 20 years. So I think that these carriers, uh, you know, we had, we tried to get an appointment with Progressive and I had an appointment with Progressive for many years, almost 12 years, but I wasn't the agency owner. And they said no, because I haven't owned the agency for three years. I They won't appoint me. Well, I, mm. I, I think that's pretty absurd. I mean, I yeah. I know I have 20 years. I have Allstate. I have the... the like, well, I, I guess I don't, and I, I haven't been in the industry long enough. Maybe I'm just, you know, not aware, but like, what's what's their risk? Like, like what like what, they're not contributing any money. Well, no, the issue is that, and I don't necessarily know, I can't speak for progressive firsthand, um, but I, I'll make a blanket statement and I would lump them into this. It wasn't hard to get a contract for a long time. And so if you're just appointing anybody and everybody, the end user experience isn't what they want it to be. Like like I said, with the bucket shop or whatever else, and they do, they do have a risk associated with it. I mean, it costs money to add an agency, have them you know, participate in your training programs and, and all of that stuff. But it's really probably just as much about the reputational risk. And, you know, why do you want to appoint an agency that's only going to give you like four or five policies a year? Now, I'm not – obviously, you probably weren't in that area oh, at all. To your commission with them, we had almost a $2 million book with them. Yeah, so. it's it's interesting. In um, there was a moratorium, like when I launched Florida Risk. See, Progressive was not there was low barrier entry to getting a contract with them originally. Like if you go back eight ten years ago, you could get anybody could get a contract then from a commercial standpoint uh, because you didn't have to have a storefront or anything else. So when I launched Florida Risk, I went out to get a contract with Progressive, and they just said, "Look, not going to happen." Uh, we, you, you don't have a storefront, you know, named all these reasons. And by the way, we have a three-year moratorium. So at two and a half years, I started hammering them again. And we ended up being able to get appointed um, last summer. But it took me three years to get the That's appointment. They, they, Yeah, they stuck to their guns. There was no talking them out of it. And what what eventually got them across the finish line to make the appointment happen was the fact that we opened personal lines. If we wouldn't have opened personal lines up, we never would have gotten the appointment. I don't think, I don't think they were looking to appoint commercial only people. So now, you know, thankfully we have them because their rates are red high yep. on, on the personal side. Um, and 
I'm adjusting a little bit about how we do business in the agency to accommodate that for lack of a better term. I mean, I've got a, I, I've got to put some money into personal lines, mm-hmm. you know, and I, that's, that was begrudgingly until last week. And last week we sat down and sort of had a planning session in the conference room. And when I started running the numbers, I'm like, holy crap, I need to put some money. David has to put some money behind the commercial line. <laughs> David Crump, you know, needs to yeah. Put some money. <laughs> yeah, I do. I got to put some, I got to put some money behind per- personal lines because I could see a path to half a million in revenue a year on personal lines. So we're going to do that. We're going to, we're going to go 90 to nothing. Um, I, I'm going to give it about 30 more days for them to have their feet under them. But it's just like today, here we are Monday morning. And, you know, one of the people that's doing nothing but selling and servicing personal lines for us now, I've already sent them five leads and it's not even, it's just barely noon. And these are warm referrals. This isn't like, Hey, uh, Sally Smith calling because she just got a renewal. These are centers of influence that are flipping stuff over to me. And I'm finally at a point where I have a comfort level that I'll accept them before I would just flip them to somebody else because I wasn't confident in our, in our ability to execute because I didn't want to try and be too many things to too many people, but it's been interesting to see how that sort of blossomed, you know, started to grow on its own a little bit. It ha- it's that has been our biggest challenge. I would say us apart from COVID COVID just came and did everyone is feeling the same with that. Like it's, and you just have to use the time. That's when we started doing, more of our content. We're like, well, our personal lines carriers are pretty restricted. And I had already spent a lot of time getting uh, like referral partners with realtors. We joined the Realtors Association down here because we had a really good thing going. And then all these carriers shut down and every single partner that sent me a referral, it's a 1964 house. Here's the four point, (laughs) 1983 house. I have nowhere to put them. Mm -hmm. I spent the first two months of COVID just saying, I don't have anywhere to put you. I have to do it through a broker with, uh, you know, a surplus line takes forever. All the fees, the policies are 10 grand, you know, it's just impossible. So that's when we took the time to just focus on our content. Really. We'd never made videos and um, the videos are still a challenge, but I don't think so. I think they're good. Well, thank you. But it's, it's a challenge to like, just when we do it, we, we've been using the office for that now. Uh, we're using the office and just our studio set up there and we just go and spend a day there. And we, how many do you knock out in a day? Um, well, I'll do, I'll do the, in like the morning and Guillermo will take the afternoon. We'll split the day, but I could, I do about four, but I, I don't have the gift of the one shot. Like it, it is, I have like more hours of bloopers than, <laughs> <laughs> than like, Quality. You should put together. You they should are. put together a video of bloopers and put it out. That would be awesome. We're gonna do it by the end of the year because I mean I forget how to say my name. It's just ridiculous. Like, <laughs> it's crazy. But we're just you know, we just Guillermo and I will look at each other and be like, hey, Carruthers says if you're ugly, you're ugly, right? Just do it. <laughs> so hey, it's not stop me. <laughs> so we're just like we just gotta get over it and do it. So. We've been doing, yeah. we're doing two a week, release him one, me one every Tuesday, and Thursday. Nice. That's good. I really want to have you guys create. I've been thinking about this. <laughs> I think you should like do a thing on, I, I don't know whether it be like stupid claims or so. I don't know. All I want is I want to cut out to your dad with the thug life in the Snoop Dogg <laughs> track playing on the. <laughs> Cut it, cut, cut to the G. Cut to the G. We, I think we can make that happen. That'd be great. Yeah, have him wearing the sunglasses <laughs> with the freaking joint hanging out of his mouth. That would be great. <laughs> He'd love it. So funny. That's great. Yeah. So obviously you have a good relationship with your dad. He sounds to me like I didn't realize his backstory that he'd worked several places. I thought for whatever reason, I was under the impression he was just always in insurance. How big of a, uh, of a help has it been to have somebody with his general business experience and just support helping you get this thing launched? It's it. I can't do it without him. He, he is so supportive of me. And, and when, when he ended up selling that agency, Throughout the years, we always spoke about, well, if we ever sell the agency, then, you know, you'll have these designations. You can go get a job with the carrier. You'll get a good job. You have the experience. And then, you know, he, we sold and, and I was like, well, I guess I'm going to go get a job. You know, like I didn't want to, but I guess I'm going to. And, and he talked me off that ledge real quick. He was like, no, you have what it takes. 
to do it. You know, you know what it takes. You've you've built these agencies with me. You've seen me do it. And the best thing about him besides his support is he's kind of risk he's kind of a risk taker. Like so he's just like you'll never know until you try. And then if you fail, you get up and you just do it again. Mm-hmm. Drunk enough that you could he goes, I started at forty nine. You have fifteen years on me. So you have time to mess up if you mess up, but you're not going to. So that's what we talked about with uh Steve Holly the other day, right? Same same sort of thing. Same mindset. Well, yeah, I mean it's interesting. I think that you need to have a balance of every in every agency, um, where you have somebody who's the risk taker and then the people that are more conservative because they balance each other out. I'm one hundred percent a risk taker. I don't care. I'll try anything once. It doesn't matter. If it works, great. If it doesn't, great. Okay, we, yeah, great. We know not to try that again, and we'll cut, we'll cut bait and move on. But I'm always of the mindset you're not going to know until you try. And if you know, a lot of people, that's where they they lose before they ever start because they're never willing to try. He always, 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 he, and you know, you know, some days, some sometimes this industry it has bad weeks where you're just like, what am I doing with my life? You know, and he's always see our. Think of the big picture. Remember the big picture. Don't get caught up in the little things. So it's that's always helped. Even when this COVID thing started, I was like, what are we going to do? I mean, we might, we can cut our loss or not. And then that's, we had already been watching your stuff. And I think that that's really what helped us like get back on track and get like kind of out of the slump a little because he was just like, no, we're not going to, this is not going to take us down. We'll just, let's invest in ourselves and let's get into a program that can teach us where we want to play. And we never have. And so he is, he's not, he's the best at that. I just, he's so good at refocusing uh, me and, and himself too. It's just, he's really, really good at that. I think that's his best thing. So when you're looking big picture, what are you clinging to? What are the goals that you have? What are you looking forward to in the future that gets you through the rough time? Because I can tell you, for me, it's the it's the place in Key West. It's coming. Yeah. Like I know that we're going to buy a two story home in Key West. The bottom half will be an office. The top half will be an apartment. I have this whole thing. I live. Listen, I think about this every single day, and I know that it's going to happen because never in my life have I ever wanted something and visualized it and done everything I needed to do to get there and not accomplished it. That's just the way that I am. I'm not haphazard in when it comes to goals. If you give me a goal, I'm going to hit it, period. It, there's no question about that. Um, so I'm at, I guess my question is, what are, the, what are your long-term goals that get you through the rough spots? I, you know, I don't have any children, and I'm not really planning on having any. So it's, it's funny because everyone knows their family. Obviously, my family is a big part of – Wait a minute. You're a woman. You're supposed I, to have I kids. Have, don't you know the stereotype? <laughs> yeah. You don't know the stereotype? Yeah. Not for me. I have, I'm a, I'm a dog mom. So that's, that's enough for me. Um, but you know, when I look in 10 years, I really just want to repay my parents back for everything that they've done for my, our family. And my goal is to travel with them. I really would love to take them on an experience of a lifetime, you know, through Europe, hopefully one day we could travel again. Um, and, and just really just achieve financial freedom. I, I really just want to be able to take care of my family. Uh, I don't need to have, you know, a million houses. I, I just, I want the flexibility, this, this job and this run owning an agency, it really does give you flexibility in your life. Um, I, and I'll have more time since I don't have children. I'll be able to use that time for whatever I want. Right now, I love to travel. I would love to create, have a well-oiled machine where it would give me the flexibility and the freedom to do whatever I want. Really, that's so. It doesn't really have a number. I feel like when I get there, I'll get there. I'll never not work in it. That's not even a thing where you just leave it to someone else to report up to you. No, I'll be hands-on, but just the flexibility. See, I figured you would tell me that you were going to do something with interior design. You know, so this is this is also probably the best thing my dad is, is that he's a realist. And when he pulled me out of the artist suit, I was crushed. I was so mad. Probably for like two years, I was upset. And he was just like, listen, now people can watch HGTV 
and you go into a furniture store and they sell you the entire house. Everything is already set. I mean, if you're not going to be like the best interior designer to make it to one of these shows, I'm not saying you can't, but you're going to have a really good life selling insurance. So why don't you just do the practical thing? The G was putting the hard clothes on you is what he was doing. Yeah. One, of, one of my wife's most successful friends is an interior designer who makes well over $100,000 a year. And guess what she designs? The inside of insurance offices. Like, is really? that crazy? That's yeah, that's funny. a job. That's funny. But why only insurance offices? Yeah, in New York. She does that's office crazy. spaces in New York. And it's like, I just was blown away that yeah. that's what she did. No, I've kind of like... I'm over it. I'm just like I'm. I've. I'm living a great life now with insurance. You know, I rather just travel. Well, then the thing is, you can you can pursue some of those same motivators. Like if you if you like creating stuff or being creative or whatever, you could do that in what you're doing now. You already are. And I've, I've like the the branding in your video speaks to that. I mean, the the yellow and the black and the sticking with it, even the chair that you guys are sitting oh. in when you're doing them and all of that stuff, like it's, it's down to the nth detail. Yeah. And so you, you prove that you can incorporate some of that into what you're doing now. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, and COVID has really given me some time too. I, I'm doing my backyard now, turning it into a little thing, you know, messing around with that, doing some DIY stuff, just, I'll, I'll get channel that energy somewhere else. But I think that I don't see myself working anywhere else, but insurance and just, and I also think it's something I can do until I retire. I could do this. So I'm 75, 80, you know, it's not a job that where I retire from and I, mm. you know, want to live a, a, a good life, comfortable life and take care of my family. Well, if you set your agency up, right, you don't ever have to leave, right. right. You can, you could just pass it on to the next generation and let them, you know, Kyle's in line. He's Whoever not going to hear. I don't know. Yeah. Ky Kyle's way, way younger than I am by like 16 or 17 years. So Kyle's right. by the time I'm ready to start doing that, then he can, he can handle things. You 13. Know? Look at that. He's probably, not, Kyle's not as patient as I am though. So he might run into some Dude, challenges. My, my patience is, I, <laughs> I have none. I have none. I have there are no people. Patience. There are people that would say that I have very little patience, and then I would like to introduce them to God. No, I disagree with that. I feel like sometimes you're too patient I'm with things. Very patient, I have, dude. I yeah. lose. I lose my shit quick no, for just. It you know. depends on what it is. It depends on what it is. So my other question is, where'd you come up with the name and the branding? Like, what, what's the idea behind that? Because there has to be a story. Yeah, there. It's honestly, it's pretty simple. I just didn't want to have especially down here, all the insurance agents, if everyone uses their last name, you know, or like, not a fan. David's not a fan of that, by the way, neither is Ciara. So, <laughs> um, I figured for a while, I was like, I wanted something a little modern. So that way people knew off the bat, they're not dealing with someone that an agency that's owned by someone's grandfather, which mm -hmm. I think is bad and good because in this industry, people like longevity and they like to know, you know, it's, it's not, in our favor right now, but in 10 years, it's not going to matter. Not going to, right. Um, right. Um, and so we wanted something. I, I, I just kept on playing around with like the one worded stuff, like the Ubers, the Lyfts. I wanted something just more modern, uh, easy, cat, kind of catchy. And so then the G came up with it. He's so, he's, he's old, but not old. <laughs> and he's actually the one that came up with the name as far as the being the bunker. Uh, cause it just invokes safety and protection and like, it's a feeling, you know? So we used to be the bunker risk shelter, but people didn't really get it. Did you start having like opioid abusers <laughs> going up at the front door, like coming, looking for a place to stay or, I mean, that sounds like it's a shelter, like legit <laughs> shelter. We'd get calls of people saying they needed to turn in their cat. Where can they drop it off? And we were like, I was going to say animals. Yeah. yeah. We're like, no, not us. <laughs> I love dogs. We used to foster dogs, but I was like, no, it's not like, so then when that started happening and then we just kept on doing some more events and people were like, I don't get it. And we're like, what do you, what don't you get? But we're like, okay, right. so let's just change it up. And so then we just changed it to the insurance and risk management to kind of, so people know, Oh, the, a bunker insurance. I get it protection so that our slogan is a move from danger to a safe place nice that's cool yeah 
What about the colors? Um, Big Steelers fan or just wanted something that looked expensive, something that looked uh, professional. It's clean. Yeah, something. That, it's clean. Like your your branding's crisp. Yeah, it's just a bl- we black just is so easy and so is white. And then we had chosen the yellow. The chairs was an accident. I actually bought those for my house. And then we put the branding, and I was like, I gotta get rid of these chairs. I feel like I'm at work every time I see the two yellow chairs. But I was like, I gotta take them to the lobby and put them in the office because um, it works out perfect there. But yeah, it was just we just really like it. It it's kind of rich looking. I feel and just looks high end. And a lot of agencies kind of use the same colors. So we're just yep. a little different, more modern. No, I think it's good. So here's here's my last question because we're bumping up on an hour. If you had one piece of advice you could give, and I'll let Kyle ask another question too, but if you have one piece of advice you could give anybody who was looking to open up their own agency, what would it be based on being a year in? Um, to be patient, be patient with the process. It is quite the process. Um, I would say to find a mentor, associate yourself with people that are way smarter than you and are doing, doing the things that you want to do. Right. So if you want to sell, you know, high net worth clients, their packages for their planes and their boats, find an agent that's killing it in that space and, 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 follow them and try to spend time with them and learn from them, it really will accelerate the process of being successful because we wouldn't have to make those mistakes on our own. Um, I think that the mentorship is a big, is a big thing. And also something that we learned in your program, the business plan, Mm. find a way to make a business. We had success with it already getting an appointment that would have never looked at us prior to not having that. You know what's funny is how many people kick and scream about putting together a business plan. Like that's just basic business. How and and I want I want production staff or anybody who is going to be responsible for generating revenue to have a plan. Like tell me, don't tell me what your goal is it is going to be to hit for the end of the year. I want you to tell me how you're going to you get gonna, there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, and I love the fact that you that you don't do it for that. They need to do it for themselves. No, there's not a chance. I hate doing business plans. <laughs> uh, I don't. Yeah. Nobody, nobody likes doing it. But I mean, it's something that you've got to have in order to get to where you're trying to go. I mean, it's just. And common, I think, I think sense. the one thing, that, yeah, I think the one thing that a lot of agencies, especially, you know, is they've come into killing commercial. One of the things that that has been eye opening has been the number that have been very, very high percentage homeowners or, or personal lines agencies with. You know, they're either 70, 30, or 80, 20, and the commercial that they write is all 5,000 or less in premium. So they're going to need carrier contracts to go into the middle market anyhow. I'm just helping them facilitate that process by doing the business plan. Now you have something tangible that you can talk to a carrier about, and you're showing them that you've actually done the market research and you understand what work is going to have to be put in in order for you to achieve those, those goals. Yeah, that, I mean, we'd been in in insurance for over 20 years and we didn't ever have a business plan like that because of that we didn't need it our carriers never asked for it not that detailed as far as like production goals the niches all that stuff and it was painful to do but i mean we put it to good use already we got our first uh our second workers comp direct appointment with icw we were able to get it and you know we're looking to use it with whoever's next whoever's willing to listen to us (laughs) Come on, Chubb. Come on, Chubb. I said, <laughs> uh-huh. step up. With Carnegie Mellon for cyber, my CCIC. I just started that. It's an eight month process. Um, and it's pretty intense. We started about three weeks ago. Uh, we're doing, my team is assigned a vertical in the uh, retail and hospitality space. So we, we chose Shake Shack because it has to be under a certain percent uh, revenue to do so we have to build a business uh, a presentation for them on their cyber all that stuff it's going to be crazy it's a capstone project that we have to do so don't mention don't mention ppp loans to shake I, shack no. they gotta, <laughs> I, was, I was like oh <laughs> what about they got a <laughs> they got a little they got a little bit of hot water yeah. over that yeah we'll see how that goes so yeah chubb come on <laughs> yeah, I mean, and there's others. You know, if you're going to play in technology, life sciences space, Chubb, Hartford, Travelers, 
then you start getting into a lot of the other a lot of the other stuff ends up having to be in a wholesale market anyhow. That's that's the other issue that you run into. But the thing I like about Chubb is that um, they're they're consistent. They never pulled out of the state. When everybody else pulled out of the state, you know, back in 04, 05, Chubb didn't. And so they're not always the cheapest. They're not always the most expensive, but they're always there. And that's how I used to sell it. Like if I was going in and somebody was going to take a property increase by moving to Chubb, it was easy to compare that to what they would be paying in excess and surplus lines, but it would also be easy to take a client that had been with them for a number of years and show them over time how they had actually come out at the same or even better because there wasn't a bunch of ups and downs in the in the rates and stuff. So they're they're definitely a marquee carrier and one that I respect. You know, I hold them at the top of the list as far as that goes. Um, so we're hoping that. Uh, we're hoping that you'll be able to do that. Otherwise we'll just figure out a way for you to funnel it all through our agency and then make it happen. Anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle, any more questions for Miss Ciara? Well, I think she answered my question um, when we were just talking about the business plan thing, but it was really just, it seemed like previously you guys have been focusing quite a bit on, um, you know, more personal line stuff and, and what your biggest takeaway or the thing that you've learned in trying to go more upstream into the middle market commercial world has been yeah it's it's even when we had that our our session last week the kelly commercial it's a whole nother world for us and then keeping like when david was saying about about jason cass and being like well what's next it's not the same process that we're used to it's you you it's not the same experience that you give you know your regular mom and pop shop business we know how to do that. I we just closed an account of an aluminum. Uh, he does shutters, and it was it was a for us what we used to write. It was that's the space we usually play in. You know, we it was about it's about a thirty five thousand dollar premium account, but that's not that's not middle market. That's not a challenge, and we're used to that. Hey, that's not nothing to sneeze at. David oh. takes thirty five thousand dollar accounts. <laughs> I'm glad Ciara is very happy for David. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> but like, I'm used to that space. But I mean, if I've never played in the space of getting commissions of a hundred grand, you know, right? So, so that whole thing, that whole process, it's a totally different process. And and the level of patience that you have to have is insane. Well, I'm right because right, it's because I tell people all the time, if we put two dozen middle market accounts on the books over the course of an entire year. That's a banner year mm-hmm. and it's only 24 accounts. That's two a month. Yeah. But if you're doing 50,000 in revenue per account and you're knocking out two a month, that's 1.2 million in revenue yeah. that you just added to your agencies. So even if it's only 25,000, it's $600,000 in revenue, you know, and I don't bat an eye at 25 grand in revenue anymore. Not, not because I'm, you know, not because I'm David, but because I'm, you know, I'm so used to seeing that that's much easier to get to today than it was even 15 years ago. So that's, that's the number one thing that I think that the changes focus is when you move to the middle market, you do have to be patient. It's a longer sales cycle and you don't need as many accounts to sustain that where you run into issues in, in, in auto owners. I talk about this all the time, forced us to fix the problem is policy count because you don't have the policy count that you do. So if I have a million in revenue and you're a main street agency and you have a million in revenue, you've probably got over a thousand policies. I might have 20. Right. So if I lose one, I've got a problem. If you lose one, you don't, you know? And so that's some of the stuff that we're working on now is, yeah, I've led with middle market, but when we got our auto owners contract, they were pretty clear. You know, we really like twenty five to a hundred thousand dollars in premium. Really, twenty five to fifty thousand in premium is our sweet spot, and we for we we were forced to start moving into that lower end of what we had done just to deliver them the kind of business they like. Now they'll write some of the bigger stuff for us too, but they did me a favor by forcing us to do that. I actually expanded the policy count in the agency at a higher rate than the revenue, which is what we needed to do because we weren't diversified. We, you know, we were at a point still where even though we had good revenue flowing in, we lost an account. It hurt bad. So we, we came from a place, especially when you do homeowners, you're used to binding multiple policies a day. 
And and this process is not like that at all. No. At all. So it's, sometimes it's just like when we find – like we got an appointment recently with the Tune Direct. Mm-hmm. And I, mm-hmm. I just placed – um they did a, actually a, a bop for me, including the building, and it's near the coast. I was shocked. And when we saw how easy it was, we we're like, well, then we need to we need to build a campaign of something for them where it could feed us in between this time of trying to get these big fish. Yeah, you need to. You have to have the big fish, and then you have to have this, you know, I, I say big rocks and smaller rocks. Yeah. I, I always have like three or four big marquee accounts that I'm going after. Um, Kyle probably doesn't even know about them. I don't broadcast what they are most of the time, but I've got the three or four that I'm balancing and then everything else underneath that, that's kind of normal middle market. Then the subset of stuff beneath that. The thing with a company like a tune is it's so easy to have a campaign that drives that traffic. And it's such a simplified underwriting process to get the quotes done that it makes perfect sense to deal with smaller businesses in that environment than if you're having to go to five or six places. Where that approach doesn't work is if it's not in a tunes appetite and now you have to go to four or five other places and enter that same risk across the board in multiple rating systems. You've already lost money on that account before you ever brought it into your agency. Yeah, it was a 12, uh, uh, the BOP was 12K. And so we got paid 15% on it. And we're like, well, this isn't a bad day to fill time. No. And if we do two or three of these a day, that that can really help us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would, I would like, seriously, that's, you know, I'm not, not that I'm going to give you advice on the middle of the podcast, but that's what I would do. Yeah. I'd take their appetite guide and build yeah. content around that and, and some AdWords campaigns and things to drive traffic to it, get them to a landing page, have them fill out the information you need. And then you've got everything on one sheet because it's not like you have to answer a bunch of stuff. They don't even for have to sign board. an application. It's kind of scary. Right. <laughs> they don't even have to sign an application. I mean, it's like Swift on the homeowner's side. Like I got to the point when I was having to do some of the homeowners quoting, I would just go to Swift first to see where they were to determine whether or not you know, I would use that as my benchmark from there. But you literally put the address in. That's it. Yeah. It's type in the address, hit get quote. Now you have here. It populated everything that you're built, the square foot, everything populated. Yeah, it's nice. So we're, we're toying around with that idea too. We're trying to figure out the Google AdWords and the Facebook campaigns for that stuff. And we have their appetite guide and um, let's see if we can dedicate some time to that too, to fill the, the space while we're doing our calls and we're doing our telemarketing, all that stuff. Good deal. Well, listen, we're at an hour. I don't want to take any more of your time. I want to be respectful of it. Tell them where they can find you because I'm sure Chubb is just chomping at the bit. To reach reach me. <laughs> um, so it's the Bunker Insurance and Risk Management. Our phone number is 954-239-7346. My email is ciara at bunkeryourrisk.com. Uh, all our social media handles are Bunker Your Risk. Um, you can come pay us a visit starting September 1st. We'll be in the office. We're in Davie. Uh, but yeah, that's how you can. Good deal. Well, I am getting ready to have to leave and get on the business end of finishing my paver patio here before long. So I've got a long, is that what you were digging out the other day? Yeah. I wondered what was going on back. Got to move the egg out to the paver patio so that I. So it doesn't get smoke up the ceiling or the. No, so that I have room for the construction stuff that's starting tomorrow. Mm, Gotcha. So I'm really under the gun, man. I put this thing off. I've known for how long about it, and of course I waited till the last minute because I dreaded it. Sounds about sounds about right. Yeah, garbage. Anyhow. Ciara, thank, thank you so you much. Guys. Really appreciate you coming on and look yep. forward to uh, watching you guys continue to rock and roll down there. Tell Guillermo and the G I that will. I send my best. I will. Thank you, guys. I'm surprised Guillermo didn't like give me the guy walking down the stairs behind you while we were recording <laughs> Close the this. Door. I closed my door. I was like, you stay up. There you go. <laughs> All right. Good deal. Well, we'll talk soon. Have a good Here. one. We'll talk. See you. You've been listening to the Power Producers Podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes, and our website, killingcommercial.com.